flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, roll call. Uh, Mrs. Mayor is not here this evening, so Christina, if you would do the roll call, please. Sure. Um, Tim Mettinger? Here. Lisa Collins? Here. Gary Dunlap? Here. Tom Cruise? Here. Alex is excused. Cheryl Hancock? Here. And Anita Jagosinski? Here. And Kate would be excused as well, so if you would mark that. I would note that we have six of the seven school board members present and would declare a quorum. Board norms reflection, if you look at your blue folders and remind yourself of the norms as agreed upon upon the board as we move forward with our meeting. Approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda has been distributed, posted, and sent to the local media. With this in mind, are there any changes? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Okay, all those in favor of approving of the agenda as published, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time? We ask that a five minute time limit per person be followed. Please come forward, state your name, address, and topic to be addressed. Okay, I don't see anyone moving forward. So we will move on to the, the fun item this evening, recognition and thank yous, introduction of new staff. It's a pleasure to see many new faces in the audience and for the public what I would ask is if they would come up to my right and line up single file. Um, Mr. Clark, if you could help them with that there and Julie, there are microphones. Um, we'd ask that you come up and just state your name, where your assignment is, and maybe where your background, if you just graduated, recent graduate, or if you came from another workplace. So. We're not going to let you go until you all come up and do it. So come on up and over <laughs> here. And, and we do want to do a, a picture afterwards. So if you keep that in mind, please don't sit down. Yes, Mr. Clark, if you draw them closer, just stand. It'd be nice if you let us know if you're a Viking fan, too. That's kind of oh, a Holman Viking fan or a, a, another fan. <laughs> there you go. Of course. <clears throat> Go ahead and start. Please do. I'm Kelly Cornetta. I'm the um, new high school counselor. I work with the first part of the alphabet, A through HD last names. Um, I interned at Holman um, throughout the entire district, elementary through 12th grade, three years ago, and then um, spent the last two years at Bangor Middle High School, and now I'm back. So. Thank you. My name's Rick Stewart, and I'm a new math teacher at the high school. I have a previous career at IBM as a software engineer and a project manager. I student taught last year at Holman High School, and this is my first uh, teaching assignment. Uh, hi, I'm Dan Lerberg. <clears throat> um, I, this is actually my second time in the Holman District. I teach language arts at the high school. Uh, I taught actually here for four years, and then took a hiatus and uh, did a, the stay-at-home dad thing, and did some adjunct work at Viterbo and, and uh, Western. Um, and then I kind of found my way back here, and I, I couldn't be happy to be back, so. And if you want to keep, she's got the idea. I can see if he wants to go behind, and thank you. <laughs> I'm Kristen Jason. I am the new fourth grade teacher at Sand Lake Elementary, and this is going to be my sixth year of teaching, and I taught previously five years in the Tulsa School District. I'm Dylan Chekowitz. Um, I was a Holman graduate in 2012 and graduated from Western um, April of this year uh, with a degree, associate's degree in network administration. And um, I'm part of Jan Wee's team with the IT services. And uh, that's pretty much me. I'm Katie Krieger, and I'm a district wide employee as the instructional technology coordinator. Um, I have 11 years in education, and I previously taught um, language arts before um, working um, as a tech. I'm Jennifer Shams, and I'm the new tag teacher at Prairie View and at Evergreen. And this is my 18th year teaching. I've taught Title I, and I've taught every grade except for second in my career so far. So. <laughs> Hi, 
I'm Tammy Bromrick. I'm the first grade teacher, new first grade teacher at Sand Lake Elementary. Previously, I taught kindergarten in West Salem for almost four years, so I'm very happy to be here. I'm Brenda Geyer, and um, I am an instructional math coach in the Homeland District this year. Um, I taught previously in the Cross School District for seven years and the Independent School District for four <coughs> years. Hi, I'm Jenny Pickett. I am a 1996 graduate of Holman. Um, I was in Blair for the last 12 years teaching K-2. I am now a fourth grade teacher at Prairie View Elementary, and I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. I'm a first grade teacher at Prairie View. Last year I did a long-term sub in third grade at Prairie View, and um, I did my student teaching at Viking last fall. Hi, my name is Lee Lohr. Um, at Viking Elementary this year. Um, this is my seventh year teaching. I'm originally from California, so it's a little bit of a change climate-wise, but I'm happy to be here. <laughs> well, I'm Samantha Weiss. I'm the new third grade teacher at Viking. Um, this is my first year teaching right out of college. I graduated in May, um, and I did student teach at Viking, so I'm very excited to be back and in the swing of things. <coughs> My name is Carly Book. Um, I am also a recent graduate. I graduated from Winona State University. I am the new kindergarten teacher at Viking, and I student taught at GET, so I was not very far away. But I'm very excited to be at home. Hello, my name is Paul Havlick. I am a math teacher at the middle school. Um, right now, I'm working doing full time title work, working with kids sixth through uh, eighth grade. Prior to that, I was teaching at the Turbo. Hi, my name is Guy Turner, uh, new middle school business ed teacher, 6th <coughs> through 8th grade. Previously, I taught four years in the Green Bay for the West Superior School District and one year in Stevens Point. Excited to be a Viking. <laughs> <laughs> Home and that is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, I'm Teresa Clark. This is my second year at Viking. I got hired a little bit towards the end of the summer last year. I'm the at-risk teacher. Um, I previously taught 4 a.m. across and I found a little bit right after I graduated, but I'm excited to be here and home at Viking. Hi, my name is Heidi Perzina. I am a fifth grade teacher at Viking. This is also my second year at Viking. I was hired in August of last year. Previously, I was teaching fifth grade in Arcadia. I'm also very happy to be here, thank you. Um, my name is Lynn Peterson. I am the health EA at Viking Elementary. Last year I was a long-term sub, and before that I was a stay-at-home mom. Hi, my name is Jennifer Wojcik. Um, I am the school nurse for Viking and Sand Lake Elementary. I come from Gunderson Health System in the pediatric and neonatal intensive care. So I'm super excited for the change of pace. Um, thank you. <laughs> and I like to Thank you. Oh, don't go away. We need the we need the picture. So Jay will help us get people lined up. As I'm just making a couple remarks, you heard that we have a very diverse group of teachers, new teachers in our district, and it's testimony to the fact that we are committed to making sure that we hire the best most talented teachers possible and teachers that come with years many years of experience I think reflect that commitment so thank you congratulations for making it through our HR process we also hear that that's very difficult <laughs> Yeah, the screenshot on the screen. Mm -hmm. Thank you and congratulations and welcome. Now we know that you um, have many other responsibilities this evening, so please feel free to excuse yourself as you wish. Um, but we do really appreciate your coming. Um, there are treats in the back, so feel free to take something with you. But um, thank you so much for coming.
this evening. Moving on to reports and discussion. The first report is the DECA presentation, and I see we have a number of students here this evening to present on behalf of DECA. I think this is the first time I've seen the suits, the blazers. So that's very nice, thank you. Blue DECA blazer. I know, I haven't seen them come here, though with it. You know that there are thousands of people who are watching you do this, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we know. <laughs> Your mom does, though. So. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for coming. All right, so hello, my name is Lydia Oh, could we have you do the microphone? I'm sorry. And you'll have to hand it back and forth. It's, it, that just gets the best reception for the videotaping that we're doing. Sounds like it's test one, two, three, no. This one's working. Oh yes, Jay it is now. That works. That's right. All right. So I'm Lydia Shriver and I am the president of Holman DECA. Hi, I'm Ashlyn Bonson. I'm the vice president of social intelligence. Hi, I'm Bailey Dubojcik. I'm the Vice President of Leadership Development. Hi, I'm Ashley Taylor. I'm your Vice President of Media Relations. My name is Becca Rich. I'm the Vice President of Community Services. Hello, I'm Ashley Kromke. I'm the Vice President of Finance. We are Holman DECA's 2014-2015 officer team, and we are assisted by our three advisors, which are Mr. Scott Schreiber, Mrs. Heather Brusky, and Mrs. Michelle Wench. Some highlights on Holman DECA include we were established, established in 1974 and we have over 300 members, which makes us the largest chapter in Wisconsin. We also have different classes offered for students, which include marketing and business concepts, advanced marketing, sports and entertainment marketing, and entrepreneurship. And throughout the year, we take place in civic, social, leadership, and vocational activities. As the Officer of Social Intelligence, I'm responsible to help coordinate the field trips along with my fellow members. And some of the social activities we participate in, recently we just did the tie-dye event, the Chuck E. Cheese event, and we just did the morning breakfast. And we worked with the food service program, and we also brought in our third and fourth term students to learn more about what they can get involved in. And some of the larger trips we take are Valley Fair, which we recently just did, and that was a good turnout. We're going to Mall of America in November, the Badger Hockey game, and at the end of the year, we will go to a Brewer game. And this helps get our members involved, and it also helps link us to all the members in our chapter. Um, next is leadership development. I focus mainly on competition. So our first competition that our members have a chance to compete is its districts. We usually take about 100 students. That's going to be at UW Style on January 10th. If you qualify there, you have your chance to go to state, which is gonna be March 9th through the 12th in Lake Geneva. We usually have about 30 to 40 students that we take there. If you continue to qualify from there, we take whoever qualifies, which is usually 30 to 40 students to internationals, which is April 23rd through the 29th in Orlando, Florida. Um, currently, we have about 55 students who are interested in attend weekly meetings for our written projects as well as our series. And our goal this year is to increase our competitors at the international conference. So the Office of Media Relations pertains to how we connect with everyone, whether that be students, chapter members, parents, community members, everybody that wants to get involved with our chapter. The following images that you see on the screen are mobile versions of our social media outlets. The first is our Facebook page. Right now we have over 200 likes, so we're very well connected. Our most latest post is a picture of us participating in the Down Syndrome Walk a few weekends ago. The next is a screenshot of our Instagram profile and that just focuses more on pictures. Um, some of the recent ones are our participation in the Steppin' Out in Pink Walk and then a sneak peek of our new school <coughs> store. And then the next slide <coughs> is our screenshots of our Twitter account. This is by far our most popular and it's the best way that we can connect with our student members. On here we post everything 
from meeting dates, reminders, leadership opportunities, and anything about other activities. Right now we have over 167 followers. So next, as the Vice President of Community Service, I work with the op other officers and members to get involved in the community and give back to the community. Um, we participate in a lot of different events. Some of those include our annual back to school cleanup. We always get the front of the school nice and spruced up to start the year again. Um, this year we participated in the Stepping Out in Pink Walk. Um, the advisors and the officers took part in that. We also participated in the Stepping Up for Down Syndrome Walk for the third time this year. Um, that was a really great way to honor Katie Sue, who is a Holman High School student. Um, it was a great turnout. Um, we also will be doing the Trick or Treat So Others Can Eat event coming up here on Halloween. And then the coat drive will be taking place shortly, and that's where we um, have coats donated throughout the district and try and work with the Home and Lioness Club to get those to families in need. Um, a couple weekends ago, we also did the Children's Miracle Network Walk um, at a football game where you could walk the track for a dollar and the money raised went to Children's Miracle Network. And then this past Friday, we had a Miracle Minute for the um, family of Kwachi Vang with a student who just passed away from Home and High School and that raised about $1,400, so that was a great cause. Um, and then also in January, we will participate in the annual holiday meal for senior citizens. So it um, is a great way for us to interconnect our gener generations. And then lastly, this will be our second year participating in the Dancing with the Sports Stars event, which um, is a charity for a different family in need. So those are just some of the community service events we participate in, and it's my favorite part of DECA. So in order to offset some of the cost and so all of our members can participate at an affordable cost, we do the following fundraisers throughout the year. We just finished up our Packer Raffle Tickets fundraiser. So our members were all given tickets to sell for that. And we will do the drawing for that this Friday. We also, throughout the entire district, did a homecoming t-shirt sale. So everyone was given an order form and if they wanted to purchase one of those, we got the profits from that. We do athletic programs, we do apparel, we get the profit from the apparel that we sell in our school store. We did two DECA dances this year, and that was a huge turnout. We also do the vending machines throughout our school. We do a TGI Fridays night, so that we get a cut of all the profits that we make that night. We do the Holman American Legion donation, and we also have a business partnership with Ultra Federal Credit Union and we wrap up the year with a flower sale, so all of our members can sell baskets, and we have a big turnout for that. We would also like to say a special thank you to Ultra, Credit, Ultra Federal Credit Union for everything they do for us and our partnership, which include they come and speak to our classroom on financial literacies, they evaluate our Ultra promotion projects, they have judged at both districts and state, they work with students on their written projects to make sure they're meet the needs and we also they also fund travel scholarships and as well as other funding throughout the year this past year we actually have done the model we've redone the model store which you can see a, a picture on your powerpoint and then we also have in the model store we have the tech wall which offers mobile banking and an atm machine for students and teachers at home and high school and now, with the new remodel, the school store can be used as a multi-purpose facility, so students are in and out of there all day. And then now I would like to invite Mr. Pawlowski, the president of Ultra, to come say a few words. Thank you. Um, Ultra has had a partnership with the uh, Holman uh, DECA Club in the high school since 2006. And uh, we feel that not only as an organization have we been able to sort of help the organization, we, we have also gotten a lot from it ourselves. We've had uh, a number of our employees who've been able to be uh, uh, supervisors in, in the uh, office store. And uh, in, our, in our training for them, they've, they've developed and they have been promoted to other positions. So we feel it's a great opportunity for leadership for, for our people and we also feel it's it's a great way for us to give back to the community uh, one of the things that's very important for us is that we feel it's more important for us to be part of the solution than the problem and this is our way of trying to be part of that solution so 
thank you for the recognition, and we look forward to a future years of a great partnership. Thank you once again. And with that, we would just like to say, say thank you to all of you guys for everything you guys do for Home and Becca. And on the picture on the PowerPoint is actually a, a photo of the uh, international career development competitors from last year in Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, we have Wisconsin and our cheese heads. <laughs> well, thank you very much. We always enjoy having students come to do presentations, and I think it was really fitting for you to recognize Ultra. I know that Tom and Mark are in the back if you want to stand and be recognized. And is that Mary? I don't know if that's Mary sitting with you. Um, they are also uh, members of Ultra's staff, and we see Mark a lot at events, local home and events, um, the golf outings and those kind of things. So we really do... Um, Jack, appreciate your partnership with us. It has been um, very rewarding for our students. I talk about it a lot when I'm talking to other school districts about the commitment to financial literacy and what the hands-on experience has been able to do for our students. And so we do very much appreciate it. So thank you. I'm very pleased that you were able to be here this evening. Thank you. And thank you, um, ladies, for your report. Again, very professional. And we, like I said, we, there's always something special when it's our students doing a presentation. So thank you very much. Yep. And good luck to you and all of your competitions. The board have comments or questions? Uh, so. You look good in your suits. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I like them. I, I just wondered, because every year you have the largest DECA chapter in Wisconsin, has there ever been a year that you haven't had the largest DECA chapter? I mean, that's pretty, that's, even when my kids were in school, you always had the largest DECA chapter in the state. Mm -hmm. And for a not large town, that's a big accomplishment. Good job. And we should probably recognize your advisors as well and thank them for all the work we do. We know that it's a commitment that you make um, to the young people in our district. So thank you very much for what you do. Oh, she's hiding in the back. Okay, then the next item is health services report by our nursing staff. It's a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, we're the school nurses uh, in Holman, and um, my name is Amy Big John. I'm the school nurse at the middle school. I'm Angie Helgopi Duell. I'm the school nurse at Prairie View Elementary and the Community 4K sites. I'm Tiffany Colkett, the school nurse at Evergreen Elementary. I'm still Jennifer Wycheck. <laughs> <Mike against Jennifer. laughs> <Jennifer. laughs> Our newest team member. And Natalie Rose Kemp is a nurse at the high school. Oh, okay. So we're here tonight to present to you a short PowerPoint regarding our uh, student health services in Holman and um, some data that we pulled from the infinite campus that we use daily for um, our students and um, uh, reports that we have done for the uh, Department of Public Instruction as well. Um, this is the, the summary report that we're going to be showing to you tonight. We're going to introduce our our nursing staff and some of our other health office staff that help out with the students throughout the year. Our district medical advisors that uh, we are required to have on board, um, the population that we serve, some of the things we do, the effect that uh, health service staff have on student attendance, and explain a little bit about accident reports. 
Um, here's a small chart with the nurses mentioned, and this is from last year. So some of our health EAs have changed. We um, do have um, let's see, some new ones this year. So the hours there, the health EAs are there to help with student overflow when the nurses are at meetings. Um, when we're called out on emergencies, there's a health aide there to cover the office at those times. Our district medical advisors are from the Holman Clinic here in Holman. Uh, Dr. Oragi and James Richardson are our doctors on board. They sign a memorandum of understanding every year with us and they're there to go over any of the questions we might have throughout the year. Uh, the time I did this report in June, the number I got of the student population was almost 4,000. Um, it's a small pie chart with the population divided among the schools. Um, these are some of the numbers we pulled from the Infinite Campus report showing the average daily meds, for instance, at Evergreen might be 25 students a day receiving a daily medication, or some would be receiving two daily uh, medications at school. Um, there's a number of students who have as needed or PRN medications on board at school in case they need it, and that would include emergency medications um, such as EpiPens and uh, Benadryl and diastat and glucagon for students with diabetes. Many students have IHPs. IHP is uh, individual health plan. Uh, we write those plans up. They're sort of like a nursing care plan, but in schools there are individual health plans and many students require those for anything from asthma to uh, tube feedings to diabetes. Um, migraine and it, it shows and it helps staff know what to do, it helps the nurses know what to do and it's made in conjunction with um, input from parents and uh, health care providers. Uh, the next column would show last year's average daily visit per office per building. Um, middle school has a high number of daily vi visits, I don't know if it's myself that attracts them or Miss <laughs> 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 <or Ms>. Brosh. <laughs> but no, middle school is a unique population. Yeah. I've, this is my 14th year going into, um, into my 14th year and it's a, it's a culmination of elementary type age group and a high, want to be a high schooler and everything in between. It's, it's wonderful but they do have a lot of needs. Um, Hearing and screening, nurses and volunteers and health EAs do hearing and screening on a yearly basis in certain uh, grades. Is it first and kindergarten first? It's kindergarten first, third and fifth. Yep. Hearing only on kindergarten and first graders. And then we also do uh, hearing vision checks as needed. Um, a lot of times teachers are the first people to notice that a student is having difficulty with their vision or with their hearing and um, will ask the school nurse to do a check and many times at that point there is something wrong that uh, we can uh, refer them to a health care provider. And we also have, uh, by belonging to the National Association of School Nurses, we have vouchers that we can give to those families that are in need that will give them a free visit to a um, optometrist and glasses if needed, which is a, the greatest program. Um, and I guess, yeah. Some of the other things nurses do, um, I did mention the uh, IHPs, we find out a lot of about students' health conditions by the uh, student health um, in information card that comes back in the summer, in the late summer, it comes back to the school health offices and we go through those and um, contact parents with more, if we have more questions about their child's health condition. 
Um, some students have more than one individual health plan, many times asthma and uh, migraines is, are some of the more common ones. Uh, IHPs, RNs are required to write those. Um, there are a number of IEPs that have nursing listed, 504s. Um, we bill Medicaid for some of our students, um, taking monies for the district that way. Mm. Doses and prescription meds. Well, the Infinite Campus was a great data gatherer for us last year and this year. Um, 14,000 doses of prescription meds were given throughout the district and 4,000 PRN meds were given. Um, we do staff training. DPI, DPI requires that to be done now. Um, we train our staff to know what to do in emergencies and how to use an EpiPen and inhaler. Um, field trips are, is when those uh, activities are required. Um, how to give a medication, a lot of kids have to take their medications along with them on a field trip. Um, anything different at the elementary level with that? No. Um, so I, we don't know, we train just about everybody, I believe, in the school district and <laughs> talk about a big job and keeping track of that. Um, our immunization compliance rate, the state requires to ha be less than or um, greater. greater than 99% and we've always come within that range. Uh, some of the medication administrations, medications that we do administer during the school day as needed or daily, pain meds are one of the highest that we have um, done and of course there's um, asthma meds would be next and then the uh, ADHD meds are, a lot of parents are working in the morning and want to make sure their child gets their medication so they bring it to school and then we're responsible for getting that to them. Staff are also trained in that for field trips. A special health condition is defined by DPI in their health services report as a health medical condition reported by a parent or a health care provider. Um, every school year the students' families are sent a student health information form and on that families will write uh, updates on their student, on their child's health conditions, maybe some medications and then that's in place for um, medical personnel in case of an emergency. Mm -hmm. And we look through all those forms twice most likely, maybe three times, just to make sure because you don't want to miss any of that. Many times at the beginning of the school year we do have meetings with parents and uh, get a plan in place, get their input on the health plan. Some of the special health conditions that are listed um, that aren't, the ones that aren't included on this that are listed a lot would be seasonal allergies, pet allergies, um, environmental allergies, and maybe some parents will write nosebleeds often or stomach aches or headaches often. Those aren't included in this graph. These are the um, asthma is the most frequent listed um, condition and it goes to the right and then back, so anywhere from there. We do have about 17 students with type 1 diabetes. Last year I think it was 18, so. And that's uh, insulin dependent diabetes. Again, these are the individual health plans that must be written by a nurse. It's based on the nursing process. It's written in collaboration. Um, an IHP is written for students whose health care needs affect or have the potential to affect safe and optimal school attendance and academic performance. And we renew those every year. And some of the IHPs that we write, um, last year altogether we had 802 IHPs written for 655 students. Uh, so a lot of students had more than one. 
and anywhere from asthma to migraines to headaches to seizures, to, um, allergy, bees, insects, um, peanuts, tree nuts, diabetes type 1, heart issues, bleeding disorders, Some of the common visits to the health office, anywhere from bumps <laughs> to bruises to eye concerns, um, middle school and high school, they sometimes get notifications and we check things out. Stomach aches are highly popular. Um, <laughs> popular tummy right? aches. Yeah. <laughs> How do you how do you measure that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so we take we take temperatures and you know the the rule the general rule is if the temp's over 100 they can go home or if they throw up or they can go home. So those are measurable things. But the tummy aches and headaches we try to address by um, getting them comfortable, maybe some water, some a break for 15 minutes, a cracker peppermints at the middle school. Um, sore throats, we can address that way. Try to keep them in school, in other words. Give them a little rest, give them a little break. Sometimes when we see them often, we think, well, there's something else going on here. We might uh, check in with the teacher, see if there's a pattern going on. Uh, check in with guidance, see if they've been seeing them, get them on board. Uh, call a parent, say, well, you know, Johnny's been coming in every day uh, and these things are going on there's a lot of times there's something deeper so uh, it's good to sort that out um, and this is interesting 95 percent of students who visit a staffed health office especially when an RN is present return to the classroom um, as I said before we try to keep them in school but we also want them able to learn and uh, grasp everything they can so that is um, 43,000 students returned to class last year, 2,000 needed to go home due to illness or injury or throwing up or temp over 100. We do have uh, something besides IC, it's called an accident report. Uh, sometimes um, accident reports are needed for co-curricular or uh, another reason in the building a student was injured and this is sent to the district office if they need that. That way I see the confidentiality of the student's medical record in the computer is still uh, guarded but uh, the district office would get the information that they need. Thank you for having us here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Are there any questions at the board? Um, you have a high liability area, don't you? You yes. have a lot of exposure. I'm just curious, what uh, do you or your peers have any success stories or memorable things you've done to improve your program or that you think you've just highlights in your career so far? I'm just, and that's really an open ended question, but I'm, I mean, you've covered so many things. I'm just curious. Well, I can speak a little bit to that. When, we've, when I first started here, nobody, there was maybe a dozen health plans in place in the district. Staff weren't being trained in um, medication administration or um, emergency medications and being documented. And maybe they'd be trained a little bit before field trip and things like that. It was definitely a safe, safe environment. But so many things have changed in those years. Um, so keeping up with all that, I think we've done a very good job here in the Holman School District. Many times other nurses from other districts will call us. Right now I have one asking for help and advice and how do we do this and we're always willing to share our information. So that is, uh, we, we're very proud of that. Um, it's always a great thing when a student gets up off their cot and they say, I feel better. <laughs> I mean, that is just the sure. greatest feeling for us. We've, we've actually got somebody feeling better. You know, sometimes they're just going to move like, <laughs> it's hard to get them going. But uh, anybody else have any? Thank you. We have lots yeah. of funny stories. <laughs> <laughs> Due to <Can> privacy laws. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Right. Well, I know at the elementary level, I've heard from just a couple people in my granddaughter. I think she's brought home a couple notes already, just this or that. But the call, I think the school always calls now if there's a head injury or yes. whatever. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that we've seen. And, and we've done that for many years, mm -hmm. even before this. Okay, well, uh, just concussion. she's only in her second year, mm -hmm. so that's probably yeah. why. <laughs> yeah, I think that first week of school, she had three notes or two notes. I don't know, between a bite and a head injury and all of that but we really do appreciate the care that you give to our students and you're there watching out for them I know that um, we were discussing numbers of RNs that we had on staff and while we have higher than maybe some of the area school districts we really do believe that that's important and I know at the elementary level they travel to different schools and um, I don't know if we're in a place right now to change that, but at least we were able to keep the, the staffing at the same level that it had been. So we're happy to have our new staff member here and um, be able to recruit um, someone. So thank you, though, for all the work that you do. Thank, thank you. you as well. Thank you. Okay, then moving on to summer school report. And I have the principals. Good evening. Um, just to let you know, we had another wonderful summer school program at the elementary level. Just have an overview here for you. Again, we were at Viking Elementary, had 555 students, so we were once again pretty full in at Viking. Um, did offer breakfast to the students, and um, the students did have two instructional blocks this year. Um, reading and math adventures is the block of classes that we have students placed in based on our data that we have. So the teachers make a recommendation if the students could use some additional support in reading and math, then we invite those students to participate. Um, once those classes are filled up, and we really kept those class sizes small this year so that we could focus on some skills, specific skills based on the data that we had. Um, once those classes are filled up, then the only thing left for the students to take are some enrichment classes. So again, we offered enrichment classes at all the levels. Um, we again provided snack for the, all the children and did have um, progress reports sent home in order to maintain open communication with parents. Um, this is just a list of the different classes that we had available and the number of sections as well as the teachers that you can see there. I think it's really important to recognize those teachers. They do a lot of work in a short amount of time and the students really enjoy being there. Again, um, so the classes in each of the, the grade levels. So kindergarten, if you go back really quick. So in addition to reading and math adventures, you can see the different, the other options that people had to select from. Nursery rhymes, exploring our world through reading and science experiments. And for first grade, again, we had about four additional classes aside from the reading and math adventures. Um, in second grade, it was interesting because um, the two classes that were offered were poetry and readers theater. And I heard from a parent, well, my son might not enjoy just taking poetry and readers theater, but you should have seen some of the writing that those boys did produce. It was really um, neat what they were able to come up with. Um, so it was very um, successful. In third grade, there were three different options in, uh, for enrichment. And in fourth grade, I don't think I should be giving the mouse anymore. <laughs> in fourth grade, we had a couple as well. Um, the outdoor adventures is really popular because the students truly enjoy being outside and be able to roam around. And uh, Mr. O'Neill really has a good time with those kids outside. So um, just, again, another enjoyable summer school experience. Um, in addition to the teachers, there are so many support staff who we just couldn't make summer school successful without these people. So I wanted to also recognize our support staff. These are just some ways that we communicated with parents throughout summer school. 
and a number of people that we want to thank because if it wasn't for all these people, um, again, summer school would not have been possible. So that's elementary summer school. Oh, and there was also a video that we created. Um, special thanks to Anne Marie Dahl. She um, put all these, we took a number of pictures and she put it all together into a video. And you do have to have a School District of Holman login in order to see this video. So if you're interested, um, I uh, encourage you to take a look. It's about seven minutes long. Great. HMS Summer School. We did some changes this year, as we do every year, trying to make the program better. So we added an ELA enrichment and had eight students enrolled. Um, they did a number of different things, including learning the history of Holman. <coughs> Specifically, they learned a little bit about the site of our current baseball field, how it used to be the mill pond, and had some speakers come in and really got a chance to learn some local history. They also shared technology resources, not only from the teacher, but between students, and then explored many different types of writing. Uh, they expanded their horizons, but also got a chance to work a lot in the areas that they particularly enjoyed. So we also added remedial teachers, like Sue said, in order to decrease our class sizes. So our average class size decreased by about 10 students. So we were able to offer multiple classes for students in reading and math, particularly. Celebrations, again, our student participation, our mu music programs continues to be very high. Uh, our CD Autism program just continues to partner with Associated Bank and with Festival to teach students life skills. Uh, those partnerships have been going on for a number of years now, and really they have been fantastic in accommodating our schedules and making sure that the students are really getting the things that they need. All students who did not meet grade, uh, who didn't meet the grade point advancement policy successfully completed their coursework and promoted to ninth grade. And then our enrichment programs continued to offer skill and creative, creativity based curriculum. You can see our enrollment here. Again, our, our numbers remain high. We are uh, doing our best to make sure that we're able to get everyone to participate. We had a total of 402 students participating and some of those students did both the music offerings and summer school programs. Good evening, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There you go. As you get older, this gets tougher. <laughs> the courses that we had at the um, high school this summer were speech, and we had 16 students in speech. Health with Ms. Coleman, 26 students. Physical education, 22 students with Mr. Bagneski. Language 9 is um, 17 students with Ms. Tolzman. Orchestra with Mr. Birdsong, 20. Band with Ms. Jensen, 110. And as you know, those numbers continue to grow for our band. Um, Color Guard with Ms. Jensen, 10. Choir with Mr. Larson, 63. Government with Mr. Gillespie, 21. Academy on the Prairie was a um, remedial program through Mr. Pagliaro, that was 13 students. And then Steps to Independent Living through the Special Education Department with Ms. Tuma and Ms. Volkman was 10 students. Many of these courses, they're designed to either be credit recovery or a chance for students to get ahead. <clears throat> there was a total of 11 courses, 11 teachers and with two EA positions. 308 students were served. Um, registration comes on a first come, first serve basis because there, we only have enough, we only have so many classes and so many seats available. Registration actually closed on May 9th, and class sizes ranged from 10 to 32. And a thought for the future, some online course options, possibly. Good. Any questions? Okay, I don't see any questions. Thank you so very much, and I like that. You're gonna say something, Mr. Bayer? Yeah, I do. I wanna make one quick comment in regards to what we did at the high school today. We started our ninth grade ACT Aspire test which is a mandated test for all freshmen. We started it today, went fairly well, but I wanna thank Ms. Jan Wee and Ms. Sebaski and then Matt Kalish for helping out with all their help today. We might have been stuck in a couple places, but it went very well and we will finish up tomorrow. Great, thanks for filling us in on that, that's wonderful. 
Thank you. You know, summer school is an opportunity. We like to see the opportunity for enrichment as well as the remedial to help those students. And what happened in the middle school, I think, especially holds true that those students were able then to advance. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to without this. So thank you very much. All right, I'm just getting back to my agenda. Next item is the reading and math reports. Good evening, I'm Amy Steckley. I'm the district reading specialist and Wendy is going to be filling in for Doug Burge who is our district math coordinator who is homesick tonight. So anyways, we're going to present to you the information that we gathered from our Title I staff and um, how we were able to provide services for students who needed extra support in the area of reading and mathematics during the 13-14 school year. The vision of our Title I programming in Holman is that we partner with the staff and the families that work with those students to really provide them the successful skills that they need to be good readers and, and solid mathematicians. In order to achieve our mission, uh, things that we work on on a daily basis is to make sure that we're using research-based interventions, that there's constant communication between interventionists, classroom teachers, and those families. Those teachers that are serving students use ongoing assessment data to guide their instruction and really making sure that those kids feel like when they're coming, you know, they're getting pulled out of classrooms, that it's a safe place for them to take risks and really try to close those achievement gaps. And we constantly look at what are best practices in providing professional development to our Title I teachers uh, so that we can offer the best instruction while they're being pulled out of classrooms. Within the, uh, the programming that we set up, um, we look to what is, what is our data telling us. We use uh, state, local data, um, and we look at the benchmarks that we've established. Uh, we reevaluate those every year and say, are they rigorous enough? Are they aligning with uh, norm data that we're looking at off of the assessment tools? And uh, based off of the data that we collect, we look at the, thir the lowest 30% are the students that we um, service in the Title I programming. And the services are provided, first of all, in a small group setting, and then if we need to move to a one-on-one -on -one, um, type of situation, you know, if this child is not making expected progress, then we will begin to look at ways to provide a one-on-one -on -one service. So we're gonna kind of dig in a little bit um, specifically with the reading section and then I'll turn it over to Wendy and she's gonna do her best to hunt for Doug tonight. So um, looking first of all uh, at the, uh, the first grade and second grade, those are the students that we assess right away at the beginning of every school year. And in both first and second grade, we use word lists, um, high frequency word lists for students to um, collect some data on what they know with those. The second set of assessment data we collect is a dictated sentence. We ask the students, we're gonna have you write us a story today. And we're looking to see can they write those sounds in words and they all have a point value to them. Um, so that's a dictated sentence. It's called hearing recording sounds and words. And then the third data point that we use in first and second grade is a running record. So students read a passage for us, we count how many miscues they make, we um, listen for their fluency, and then we ask them questions that they have to respond to. Um, and then we take a look at those three parts and make our, our determining factors as far as um, if they meet benchmark criteria or not. In kindergarten, we do not formally pick up until January. We wanna give those chance of kids to get acclimated in case they've not been to any kind of a preschool or daycare setting, um, given the benefit of um, soaking up our good core instruction that our kindergarten teachers are offering. And then in kindergarten, when we screen in January, there is a concepts about print assessment, which really talks about um, how do children know how to handle a book, front of the book, back of the book, cover, one-to-one um, -one correspondence, tracking, and then that return sweep and how to read text. Um, so just a lot of book handling skills and book knowledge. And then again, a dictated sentence and a running record to um, assess again, reading accuracy, fluency, and comprehension. So these are our uh, end of the year data that you will see here. And for um, kindergarten, we have our hearing and recording sounds and words. 
the concepts about print and the text levels and we have it broken down by building and then the last column shows our combined data so out of the 28 students that we serviced 100 percent of them met the hearing and recording sounds and words and concepts of print um, that's one of those areas that we've the last few years it has a we've used a stain nine score that's nationally normed and uh, we picked a, a rigorous benchmark to go with that and that's an area that we're continuing to work on um, and that students struggle with and then our, our text level we had 71 percent of our students in the buildings um, meet that end of the year benchmark and we have evergreen sand lake and viking um, on the top grid and because those schools are targeted title one schools so they because of the percentage of students that receive free and reduced lunch we do get funding for that uh, at prairie view since they do not meet the the criteria for title one funding we do have a reading resource so for comparability purposes students are you know students everywhere will have uh, struggles in reading so we do provide a reading resource teacher there and um, we had 100 percent of the students meet the recording sounds and words um, they struggled with the text level there so and then uh, the concepts about print one out of the four students there so we're, it's a small students a group of students that were there in kindergarten so the the numbers when you factor in they didn't meet expectations would look pretty dramatic but we're talking about four students in first grade um, you can see again the combined data for those um, hearing recorded sounds and words was very high um, the text level we had 62 percent and 76 percent with our frequency high frequency words and then the prairie view data for reading resources there as well and our second grade data free assessments as first grade and their scores in middle school we use some multiple measures to um, take a look at how we screened students there we use the map test which is administered three times throughout the year so we look at their map data we also use Ames web as another measure and then the Fantas and Pinnell benchmark assessment system which is the same it's the, the continuation of what we use for the running records in the elementary so that's a nice consistent thread and for middle school students um, who did not meet criteria in the fall when we worked with them throughout the course of the year uh, exciting to see that when we look at that benchmark assessment system that 91 percent of those students did um, meet their grade level expectations so they really did a night the middle school teacher um kendra bringing who was at the she's the only one there doing the um the support there she was able to bring a lot of those students up at the middle school so i'm going to turn over to wendy to you talk about math so all kindergarten students are screened across the district using assessments that are based on the NCTM standards common core standards and district grade level expectations in first and second grade similar to reading the lowest 30 percent of students are scored and screened against our district benchmarks similar to reading we use multiple assessments to look at what areas of need do our students have and you'll notice different assessments and if you look you'll see some common threads like the hiding assessment across and and you will see that the expectations do increase across the number trains and also you know the different assessments like for example kindergarten just counting and making a quantity so counting how far can they count up to and if you ask them to make 13 can they move 13 markers into a pile to make a count to make a quantity so so looking similar to reading our kids do not qualify until January and you will see then our students that were able to count a pile of 32 on down to the hiding assessment our kindergarten little folks did very well so for our grade one students they are again assessed in September and the lowest received services and you will see that different from reading we do not have services at this time for math at prairie view but we do for the other three elementary schools and you know when you look at 
their area that they struggled a little more. It's a, it's a higher level expectation, but the combination trains of 20. And second grade, also qualifying in September, and services are offered to the most struggling students. And you will see, you know, the, the students that did make benchmarks on the different assessments in the last column. And then at middle school, we start, we have title math, and last year was the very first year that we had title math available at middle school. So this year, or last year, we used the MAP math assessment and WKCE to look at students who needed more support. And then throughout the year, the MAP assessment was given to monitor progress and possibly have more students receive Title I services. We also use the Marilyn Burns Diagnostic Math Assessment, which is linked to one of the interventions that they use. <coughs> Excuse me. So when you look at just on this slide, just shows the number of students that met the end of year benchmark. Um, it, using the MAP assessment, it doesn't look very promising, but when you look, you know, the students on average grew seven points on MAP, and that's pretty character, I mean, that's huge, because most kids in middle school gain three to four points in, in a year, so growing seven points really is telling, it just shows that the students that were picked up did have such a gap that they made progress to closing the gap, but weren't quite there yet where we wanted them to be. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about how we dismiss students out of Title I. And we have, you can see the bullet points there, kind of talk about the different assessments that we use. But uh, at, the, at the end of the year, we really want to say how many kids were we able to help close the gap. So um, out of all of the service students that we provided um, in reading last year, we were able to dismiss 61 students from Title I services. And in mathematics, we were able to dismiss 44 students. So, um, and then in the middle school for reading, um, we were able to dismiss 21 students at the end of the year. So, and then you see the criteria that they used there for um, the dismissal. And then math. And similar to what I just reported on <clears throat> math, they did not dismiss any students, but the students did make huge gains in their first year of title. And that ends our report. Do you have any questions? Are there any questions? All right, thank you very much. We will move on to enrollment report, Julie. Good evening. Uh, this report is to give you some information on our third Friday enrollment for the current 2014-15 school year. <clears throat> the third Friday this year was September 19th, 2014. All students who are enrolled and present in our classrooms are counted. This includes students who are open enrolled into our school district. This count represents the number of students used to determine staffing projections, material purchases, and facility space. However, the head count is different than the count reported to DPI for funding purposes. This chart represents the number of students that attended and were counted on September 19th. This is our head count. This is used for staffing materials and facility space purposes. Overall enrollment increased at the rate that we projected. This chart represents the student headcount enrollment growth from 2013-14 to 2014-15. As you can see, we continue to grow in enrollment. Remember again that this is this is that the headcount is not used for funding purposes. 
A full-time equivalency is used to determine the average daily membership, which is different than counting the number of students in the class or the starting head count or pupil count. The FTE is the result of taking the student count and applying a factor of less than one to four-year-old kindergarten students and early childhood special education students since they do not attend school all day. In addition, open enrolled students both in and out are factored into the calculation along with tuition waivers in and out of the district. The FTE determines the level of funding. Our 2014-15 September FTE is 4,010, an increase of 75 or 1.9 percent. Our summer school FTE is 47, a decrease of 17 or minus 26.6 percent. The total FTE is 4,029, an increase of 68 or 1.7 percent. The revenue limit calculation mm -hmm. applies a three-year average computation to create the current average. The current average is 3,951, an increase of 78 or 2 percent. What financial impact does this have on us? With all other things being equal, our revenue limit formula will be increased by $51,000. Our 2014-15 summer FTE of 4,010 is a decrease of five compared to the projected FTE. Our summer school FTE of 47 is a decrease of 17 compared to the projected FTE. The total FTE of 4,029 is a decrease of 12 compared to the projected FTE. We continue to experience more students open and rolling out than in, which has been a consistent trend in the district. We experienced an increase in the number of students open and rolling into the district as well. The number of families choosing to open and roll out of our district continues to be a concern. Our past efforts to understand the reasoning behind this concern have proven to be less than helpful. This fall, we have begun to work with an outside agency to collect the data on our families who choose school districts other than the school district of Holman. As soon as I have that information, I will be back here to report that to you. Even though there continues to be a gap between the open and roll out and in requests, our overall student enrollment does continue to grow. Questions? Are there any questions? Mr. Menninger? Just a quick question or maybe more of a comment. It's really great again to see the continued growth here in the Holman School District. On the open enrollment numbers, I know we all continue to kind of scratch our heads on that. And in, in how it's reported, I know the in over, in overall enrollment, you know, we show kind of like the grade school, the middle school, the high school level. Would we be able to see this open enrollment broken down by that, that similar way as well to see, you know, how is it at the grade school middle school and high school level. Absolutely. Yep, I can share that with you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Julie. Um, and then I think you're here for the special education EA for Evergreen Elementary. Yes, in your packet you have an issue paper requesting an additional educational assistant at Evergreen Elementary. Um, this is due to some transfer in students with some significant need. Uh, we are not currently able to meet that need without an additional um, educational assistant. So I am here tonight to ask for that um, because it's very timely and um, we need that. Um, as soon as we can get that, you will also see that this is on your consent agenda tonight. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, then I will move on to the consent agenda. There are nine items on the agenda this evening. Um, unless someone wants to pull one of those items out, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Then moving on to board member reports and discussion, I'll call on board members in order of roll call. I ask you to present any committee reports or any comments that you'd like to make. Mr. Menninger. 
Uh, just uh, real quick comments. The uh, Buildings and Grounds Committee met tonight. Um, we uh, probably the, the biggest thing on our list was um, looking at all the policies that we have coming up. We actually have a very light year this year, so we're putting a plan together to actually uh, get out ahead and uh, work on policies up through, I think, uh, 2017 date and uh, uh, kind of trying to take a few of those every year um, so that we get at some now and then certainly we'll keep our committee busy throughout uh, throughout the coming years. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, other than just a couple of continued updates and things that we work on, um, you know, around some of the, um, you know, enrollment numbers now, we'll take some of that and look at that at our next meeting and how that could impact the, uh, the buildings and grounds usage, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Collins. Um, not a whole lot. We haven't had a finance committee meeting since the big budget series of budget meetings um, several <coughs> weeks ago, but we do have a um, budget or a um, finance committee meeting next Monday. Um, and we're going to be doing kind of the same thing that Tim talked about um, on his committee, is kind of looking at the different policies that, you know, need to be reviewed coming up. Um, one other issue that was brought up during the finance committee meeting was just um, thinking about uh, including more um, public participation in committees in general and seeing if we can be looking at having some several more people join the finance committee um, possibly staff parents community members things like that to have an equal representation on that that committee so are you putting that plea out to people if they're interested to let that will Dr. be discussed okay. that will be discussed so in the future so mm -hmm. okay thank you mm -hmm. uh, mr. Dunlap well, I mentioned a couple of months ago about uh, how good I thought the band was, and they've proven me true. Uh, they won the first place at the Apple Fest Parade, and they won first place in the October Fest Parade. And uh, as Mr. Bear says, the, the numbers are growing. And I did hit a little rumbling today and yesterday about the possibility of starting to solicit for some new uniforms for that band. Mm -hmm. So that's out there to talk about. And the dance team also won first place at the Oktoberfest dance competitions. Congratulate those guys. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Mr. Cruz. No, nothing, I don't have anything. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Jagosinski. Um, I wanted to say, first of all, welcome to all the new staff members. It was, it, it was nice to see the faces that will be attached to those names that we see in reports and um, information over the, hopefully, a long time. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to the district nurses for their presentation. As somebody who has to fill in for the nurse very frequently in the district I work in, I totally can relate to the, hey, I feel better, or, oh, my stomach hurts in this generic way that you're describing. <laughs> so I do understand, and Holman is very, very lucky to have um, as many nurses as we have. They are needed, and I wish other districts would follow Holman's lead. So thank you, thank you, thank you for not sending my daughters home all those times that they wanted to go to so many years ago. I used to hear, they wouldn't send me home, Mom. She gave me an ice pack. I'm like, Mom, there you go. So thank you for that. Um, also, last week we had the Personnel and Governance Committee meeting, and we discussed at great length <clears throat> um, paid leave for people going on any kind of extended leave like maternity leave or some kind of medical leave. Um, I believe Jay or Cheryl are going to be addressing that issue um, right after I'm done talking. So um, we had a really good conversation and hopefully we could make some changes that will make us be able to continue to say that we are a school district of choice and that we treat our employees the right way. So that's all I have. All right, thank you. Well, I guess it is me. I, um, I did get the opportunity, the pleasure to attend homecoming and present Mr. Olson with the Alumni Award. Um, it's fun to, to get to those games because you see the band and you see the dance team and the cheerleaders and, and all of that, but also to watch it through my granddaughter's eyes. She was having a lot of fun with that too and, and just watching the game and, and all of those sorts of things. and. Um, being out there on on uh, the football field, I think I told maybe Anita this that I thought about it. The last time I had been on a football field at during halftime was 40 years ago when I did we did a pom pom routine at my alma mater. But you yeah, still, you 40 still years ago, I still remember routine. the pom pom routine. So yeah. 
Um, so it was a pleasure being there. I would note that um, we have an athlete at State Golf today. She is in fourth place, tied for fourth. It was She scored like a 76 or something like that, I think, and so that's wonderful. Wish her good luck. Um, and then as Anita mentioned, the uh, Personnel and Governance Committee did meet. We were able to um, move some policies forward that we will be seeing on our next agenda. There were some um, housekeeping kind of things and, and committee and language that we'd seen before and that sort of thing. I, th I think it was um, employee handbook language. I'm sorry, it's not policies. But we, are, we did make some progress on that. Um, as Anita mentioned, and I know the board um, has been hearing a little bit about some of our paid leave um, policies and procedures, which we've implemented, and it, this isn't the first year, but we just really started hearing about it, I think, because of the number of occurrences this year. Um, so I am going to turn it over to Mr. Clark, and um, I think he has a report for us. And the board, you should have received an email, or there is a copy um, of an email in your binder, but Mr. Clark. I'll try to remain relatively brief here, but I think the intent tonight is to make sure the board's getting all the information at the same time. Um, as Ms. Jagosinski referred to, we did have good discussion on this uh, last week. Uh, some employees attended and we learned um, some things about our paid and unpaid leave benefits. Um, tonight we uh, come to you with some potential solutions. You've received copies of those in advance, I think it's important that you start by uh, creating a brief understanding of what drives the solutions that you presented. Um, so there really are uh, two issues. The first one that I'm going to focus on is uh, maybe um, best summed up as miscommunication. Some employees believe that the pre-2012-13 practices regarding crediting of paid leave um, had remained in place and in fact in 2012-13 and then again in 2013-14 um, those practices uh, had changed however by the time the employees realized the changes had been made they were really in well, I guess I could say irreversible circumstances in terms of their need to take the unpaid leave and maternity was referred to earlier and that would be one of the things that's I'm going to be on unpaid leave and now I'm facing an alternative reality to what I understood was in place. Um, this leaves them really with an unanticipated unpaid leave choice. Um, one of the potential solutions that we've presented to you is to temporar temporarily revert to the pre-2012-13 practice. And that's what you received a copy of today. Um, this would align the paid leave access to what the affected employees base their decisions upon. I do need to inform you that we are aware of one employee uh, that this action would have an adverse effect upon. This is an employee who understood the employee handbook language and managed their leave time and events preceding that to best take advantage of the current language. And so that creates a little bit of a conundrum because that person's going to be adversely affected if we make this change. I'm trying to figure out a way to now carve out that person from amongst all others um, so that no one is adversely affected. So we have some continuing work to do um, on that. Um, so that is the first issue um, that uh, we bring to you. The other one is uh, related to new hires and paid leave. Um, staff new to the district, um, specifically those that do not qualify for FMLA eligibility. And so under the Federal Medical Leave Act law, you have to work for 12 months and have 1,250 hours in that 12 months to be eligible for FMLA leave. Um, these new individuals are not protected by FMLA and um, therefore some of the benefits that protection that goes with FMLA does not apply to these individuals. Uh, in most cases employees uh, can use short-term disability benefits offered by the district to address the loss of benefits that occur during unpaid leave time. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for these individuals 
If they have a pre-existing condition, short-term disability exempts coverage. So imagine, again, the case of a maternity, someone accepts the position in the district, they have a pre-existing condition of maternity, they find that out, but short-term disability won't cover because maternity, pregnancy, is considered a pre-existing condition. So they're not eligible for FMLA, and they're not eligible um, for short-term disability. And so there's no safety net. Short-term disability serves as a safety net in most cases. So you have before you a language proposal that's intended to ensure a greater amount of paid leave eligibility in the first year of employment than is currently in place. And while this will not provide full paid leave benefits for those individuals, it provides them an opportunity to access the greatest first year amount of paid leave that um, the district offers. So those are the two possible the issues and the possible solutions you see. These come to you because, as you can imagine, based on some of the descriptions I've used, timeliness is important to these individuals. Um, they are expected and there are impending leaves. Um, so uh, we normally would address these things through the employee handbook process, sometimes taking three months or more. That just does not seem to match the urgency um, of these individuals. These are presented to you as temporary solutions to address the immediacy of the responses. Um, permanent solutions may come in the future. Uh, those deserve our deepest consideration and understanding of the issues. As you can imagine with leave, unpaid leave, health insurance, short-term disability, long, there's many moving parts here and I don't want to come with a permanent recommendation that's only going to transplant one problem with another one. Um, but we think that a temporary solution is, is something the board should give strong consideration to. Thank you, Mr. Clark. So as, um, if you recall, and I know we, Lisa was, and Tom weren't on the board at the time that we were doing the employee handbook, but one of the mantras we had was that the handbook was something that was a living document, that if we discovered somewhere along the line that the language that we changed had an adverse effect on our employees, um, that we would take a look at those sorts of things. And I think it was Mr. Clark at the meeting who suggested that we find and do something temporarily. This isn't meant to be, um, it's not on the agenda, it's not meant to be an action item, but again, we wanted to see if there was some consensus and um, with having the administration move forward on their recommendation to take these steps to um, support the current staff that we have. So unless I hear any great adversary to this, um, I think this would be the recommendation of the, of the administration. And Dr. Carlson and I did have a conversation this morning about it as well and um, before this came out, so. I, I guess I just um, was, I just wanna make sure that I understand. So the, um, the first, the paid leave vesting, temporary paid leave benefit hiatus, not the one for the new hires, but the one mm -hmm. for the existing employee, like, longer term employees than just one year. Um, okay, currently the language is paid leave though credited at the beginning of each fiscal year is vested only upon completion of the work year. And that's the part in the handbook that there was disagreement of interpretation on. So the language that you're proposing which says paid leave is credited at the beginning of each fiscal year this paid leave amount will not be subject to adjustment due to unpaid leave. Adjustments will be made in the event of termination or resignation of employment. So what's the difference between those two passages? Well, the first uh, major difference is the vesting requirement is removed temporarily. And maybe you could explain vesting uh, and credited. Sure. And just so we all are on the same page. Sure. Uh, when it says that the ben uh, find the exact phrase here, um, the credited amount at the beginning of the year is vested only co upon completion of the work year. That mean this is like a, a retirement benefit. You may have it, but you may have to uh, achieve certain thresholds to be fully vested in it. 
And that's what that vesting language means here. It's credited to your account at the beginning of the year. You have to complete the year to become fully vested, <clears throat> and that is to actually earn the full benefit amount. And we've suggested in this temporary solution that the vesting requirement be removed. And that to go even further, we say the paid leave amount will not be subject to adjustment due to unpaid leave which is currently the adjustment that's occurring because the paid leave benefit says you have to work at least 10 days in a month to earn the benefit, to earn the day for that month. And we're, what we're suggesting to you, thank you, Anita, that we're all clear on this, is that's removed. You get the days at the beginning of the year, and you're going to have those days even if you have three months of unpaid leave. That's You'll get your thing. paid leave that you would have earned if you had worked all year long, like whatever it is, nine or ten days or whatever. And personal days are also covered under this because this, I understand This that. language does not address personal leave, but the personal leave language does not include the vesting requirement. But there was one person at the meeting who said she did yeah. not receive. And we're investigating that to make sure we understand what okay. happened there and whether any correction needs to be made. You're right, one person did bring that up. Okay, so it, it, if, if we uh, have consensus on this language, peop, whoever, not just necessarily women, but anyone going on medical leave, if they go on medical leave, say, in September, they could use their leave days that were deposited in their leave day bank on July 1st and would be earned by the end of the school year. They could use them before they're technically earned, they would still be available to them. They wouldn't have them withheld and then credited when they return. Even if they're never going to earn them. Yes to your question, and <clears throat> even beyond that, even if they ever do, never do earn the days, they're gonna get them. The only time an adjustment would be made is if there's a termination. Then we might go back, well, then we might, then we would go back and we would say, listen, you took more leave days than you ever earned. That's the only adjustment that this temporary language calls for. Jay, just prior to the handbook being implemented, so the system previously was on an anniversary date, they would, not new employees, we're talking about ongoing employees, would be granted their whatever level they are for time that they would accrue each year, right? On a certain date. It wasn't like kind of slowly adding to that account, which it is now. Um, it is, let me deal with the prior circumstance. Prior, uh, uh, prior to the employee handbook, there was an allocation all at once. Right. There was, we've never had, Melissa, is this correct? Uh, at least during my time here, I can't remember us ever having a, you work a month and then you get a day. Right. You work a right. month, you get a day. We've never had that system. I work for human services, same thing happened. That we used to, on June 1st, I would always get my three weeks vacation. You know, however long you are there, you get three to four weeks vacation or other sick time kinds of things. Um, what happens, so with sick, with sick time or personal time, however you want to describe it, people can use vacation time to correct for their maternity leave, right? They can use have it if they have it. Yeah, not all employees have vacation time. Does, so the vacation or the personal time comes also incrementally, vacation comes incrementally too, or do they automatically get that on a specific date? Everything is allocated at, on July 1st for the next school year. Vac vacation. For the fiscal year. Okay. Vacation, paid, personal, loyalty, all of it. Okay. And then what happens if they go into the next calendar year? Do they ever lose any of those benefits if they're not used? Um, depends upon the benefit. Right, depends upon the benefit. In the unpaid leave language, there's language about not accruing additional or new allocations of leave. So if you crossed over fiscal years um, and you were on unpaid leave, you would not earn your new allocation until you returned to um, work or went back on a paid form of leave. So if, if they're on maternity leave crossing over into the months into the next year, that's what you're saying, right? If the maternity leave stretches out between several months, which it very well could, right? 12 weeks, potentially nine weeks. It depends on the type of leave benefit, yes. Um, but then when they return to work, they would be allocated those days. And so if you can keep track of all that's going yeah. on in this dialogue, <laughs> yeah. I would suggest to you this illustrates the complexity of this yeah. issue, which is why I would not recommend a permanent solution at this time, because there's many, many, exactly. many moving parts. And um, 
I couldn't in good conscience recommend to the school board that in this short time frame that's required to address the needs of these people that you you engage in uh, appropriately that full dialogue mm -hmm. and how about with new employees the <clears throat> the new hires what's the difference between because the language we didn't have a separate new hires language in the handbook previously correct so what is the difference between what we had in there and what you're proposing tonight? well what we have in there now is the vesting requirement right and is the FMLA law and so these individuals um, come in and they're not covered by FMLA and so they their their accrual of benefits because FMLA says you cannot treat the individual's benefits differently during the FMLA period they don't continue to accrue because their benefits are not protected by FMLA and so this says much like the prior example that we just talked about for these employees in your first year you're going to be fully vested from the first day you come the reason it was the solutions are actually much the same they look the same I did not want to presume that the board was ready to address both of them so I presented them separately so if you said you know this one over here makes sense but I'm not so sure on this one yet you wouldn't have to start extracting the two from one another so like the, I knew I know there was a staff member here tonight who's a new hire because she worked in the district I I work in yep. um, and so she would be able to use mater her leave days toward her maternity leave because she's not eligible for FMLA but she would be able to use her however many nine leave days when she goes on maternity leave in looks like fairly soon um, <laughs> she would be able to use those correct because we're assuming the the good that they're coming back to work that they're not going to say well i'm going to stay home for five years with my child and i used more leave than i earned but sure. too bad we're assuming that they're they want to be employed here and they're coming back correct we are assuming that but even uh, under the current language mm -hmm. even though we would assume that good thing that the employees coming back what would happen is the time that they were gone they would not be working 10 days in certain months but they would be regularly scheduled they just wouldn't be working them the language says they have to be paid for 10 day, oh, days I in the month days. but the time the leave the leave is it a paid leave no, no. it's unpaid, oh, unpaid. we're just talking unpaid okay they are not paid not 10 days in the month so under the current language they would not accrue any of the leave in those months so yes we hope um, the best case scenario works out whether it's the current language or the new language this language guarantees them the 10 days and it's nine uh, pardon days. me nine days uh, it's so important for these individuals because they have no safety net where the current employee the ongoing employee always has short-term disability to fall back upon uh, that's not even available to these individuals because it's a oftentimes a pre-existing condition so will we also get an update on the personal day thing that we heard about at the we certainly can share with you I've been in communication with the individual employee who brought that up to me dealing with it as a personnel matter at the administrative level okay. but if you'd like uh, updates on that we can sure do that okay so any other questions so w consensus that the board moves forward or the administration moves forward with its recommendation I'm seeing heads nodding and can you repeat it all again? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. So, can I just ask a question real quick? Uh, will we get the information? Like, so if it's going to be on for a vote next board meeting, can we get, will we get the information, you know, uh, for any follow up questions prior to that meeting? Like, it really uh, won't be on for a vote. Oh, I think what this is doing is doing a, the administratively recommended short term um fix until it can move through the personnel and governance committee okay. to bring forward a recommendation based okay. on um, that discussion and okay. policy and then i know we asked for quite a bit of information from administration at the personnel and governance committee um, for them to you know show us why the change and those kind of things and right now what we're just doing is making a change for new employees but taking a step back to prior practice for ongoing employees and um, but again because there was a lot of conversation about it we wanted to make sure that the board was aware of what was going on and and mm -hmm. 
was in agreement with the direction because it is kind of a, a big thing to take that step. So, but we will keep you between the personnel and governance committee. We'll keep you informed. Thank you, Thank you. Anita, for bringing it all up. Sorry. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Clark. So then I will move on to um, board correspondence, the red folder. I think you saw, I think it's around, I haven't seen it, but um, there is a letter up to Steve O'Malley regarding the TIF district and then also to Tara Johnson regarding the highway um, home and drive speed limit. I would note upcoming meetings, October 27th, we have a board meeting, November 10th, and November 24th, we have a board meeting. Um, I think we are also trying for November 19th. We've got a tentative date set with Matt Fail for our um, meeting with him, our, our um, <coughs> workshop with him. I would note that um, when Kate comes back, Anita and I did attend the WASB regional meeting and it was good as usual to um, see other school board members. We, our meal was f farm to school kind of meal that was prepared by a chef who he had come out of Chicago originally, moved back to the area and it was delicious, it was all local kind of foods and those sorts of things, and which I know we do a really good job on um, here in Holman. And we also saw, I think, the chickens thing not too long ago, and I've mm -hmm. been having a lot of people reach out to me and asking me about that. And um, there was an election there for the, the regional representative, and Kate also was recognized for attaining level one um, of board development. I will give that to her when she comes to the next meeting. Um, so any board meeting reflections? Otherwise, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All those in favor of adjourning, um, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. We are adjourned. <laughs>